So I want to talk about 1997, when Libby was first elected to Parliament, and it was her first day of her first term, after or the beginning of six terms as an MP. I can only imagine how daunting that would be to have your first day on the Hill. And the story I want to tell you is how this first day and this first experience is so emblematic of everything that Libby stood for thereafter. So Libby's on her way to the Senate, um, and she's making her way there for the throne speech, and she crosses paths with Alan Rock, who was recently appointed at that time to be Minister of Health. So Libby takes that opportunity to introduce herself as a new MP, uh, you know, first day on the Hill. There's Alan Rock, and she's introduced herself and says, Hi, I'm Libby Davies from Vancouver East. She also realizes that she has the Minister of Health sort of captive in the hallway and has an opportunity to tell him about a public health emergency that's taking place in her community. A public health emergency in the downtown east side. Rates of overdose, HIV, hepatitis, rates of addiction that are unseen anywhere in the Western world that are plaguing her community. So Alan Rock, of course, is very polite about it and says he's glad to meet her and says we should set up a meeting. And Libby says, okay, we'll do that. And Libby, after that day, then goes to follow up with Minister Rock and follows up by email and follows up by letter and phones many, many times over the course of a month. Uh, and he refuses or does not respond. So Libby, being as persistent and committed and as dedicated as she is, and with an awesome background in activist training, does what any good activist would do. And she walks down to Alan Rock's office, and she does a one-woman sit-in in his reception. <laughs> and she sits down, and she's smiling, her lovely, perfect Libby Davy smile. And she says, hi, I'm Libby, and I've been contacting you for a meeting. Minister Rock said I could have one. You haven't gotten back to me. There's no meeting set, and I'm not leaving until I get my meeting. So, of course, they're all awkward and uncomfortable, and Libby's feeling like she's doing exactly what she needs to do to get the meeting that she needs to properly represent her constituents. She then indicates that she has the media waiting outside, just in case the pressure of all Libby Davies and her in their waiting room wasn't enough. And sure enough, the receptionist sort of runs into the back room and comes back with an appointment. And six years later, of course, it was in Vancouver East, under Libby's leadership, that North America's first sanctioned injection site was established. It was your willingness to step out of your comfort zone on your very first day as an MP and speak on an issue that nobody was talking about in Ottawa and take a stand for your community that just, for me, sets you apart from everybody else. And I just can't say enough about Libby's leadership on that issue. Her fight thereafter to save Vancouver's injection site when it was under threat from the Harper government. Her willingness to consistently speak out and consistently push us to do better and be better. Her willingness to move Canada and Vancouver towards innovative addiction treatment and harm reduction programs. Her unbelievable compassion towards this community. And she's continued to fight so hard for this community and so hard for the issues that matter here. And uh, so in preparation for the speech, I wanted to talk to some folks from the drug policy movement and see what Libby meant for them. So I contacted Dean Wilson. And Dean, you may know, is a longtime member of the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. He was a plaintiff in the case that, that uh, protected and found that access to insight is a constitutional right. And Dean is a longtime and amazing uh, member of the drug users' rights movement. And here's what Dean has to say. Oh, and he's talking about Bill C2, so sorry, I have to expand my story. So after uh, Libby and the movement and PHS and Dean Wilson fought to save Insight, the Supreme Court of Canada said it's a constitutional right to access and, and be able to have a supervised injection facility in the city of Vancouver. The Harper government's response was, of course, to enact new legislation to make it difficult for an injection site like that to open up anywhere else. That was called Bill C-2, and Dean went and testified before the Parliamentary Committee, and that's what he's talking about in this quote. He says, the moment I liked best with Libby was when I had mentioned in my testimony at the Senate hearing on Bill C-2 that Jesus would have supported safe injection sites. Her eyes lit up and she said that that quote had driven the Conservatives nuts. <laughs> this was at the end of her career and you could tell she still had the passion for politics. I will truly miss her and all she does for my community. 
So now we have a sense of what Libby's first day on the hill involved and what that looked like and how she was just like straight out of the gates running. And I want to tell a personal story about my own first day on the hill. And I, of course, was not an MP, I was an activist, and in fact was a law student at the time. And this story, for me, symbolizes everything that our relationship has meant to me and everything you've meant to the movement that I'm part of. So this takes us back to 2004, and I'm a law student, and I've dedicated a couple of years to working in the downtown east side with sex workers and helping them craft statements to Parliament about the harms created by Canada's prostitution laws. So we've collected 95 statements from sex workers about the harms created by those laws, and we've packed those into this gigantic binder, we've called it Voices for Dignity, and we're determined for someone to read it. But we're not really sure how to get anyone to read it. So we called Libby, of course. Um, at that point we knew, and it was absolutely clear that Libby was a leader on this issue. She was the first MP to raise the issue of missing and murdered women in Canada. She was also the first MP to raise the issue of violence against sex workers in the downtown east side, and to name Canada's prostitution laws as the cause of that harm. She was bringing those issues forward like so many at a time when the government refused to pay attention. So I have this 350 page report, I've written it, it's all of these words and powerful stories from sex workers from this community, and I've got like no idea how to get anyone to pay attention to this. So I call Libby, and she says, well you should come to Ottawa and you should meet with ministers. And I'm like, well that sounds good, but like, Pivot is nobody, I'm a volunteer law student from the downtown side, how on earth do you make any of this happen? And of course, by some miracle, and by miracle I mean because of Libby, um, I was able to secure 13 meetings with ministers in Ottawa, including the Minister of Justice and the Minister of Public Safety. So now I just need a plane ticket, and I managed to get a donated plane ticket, and I find a couch to sleep on, and I arrive in Ottawa. I've stacked, you know, these, I've stacked 13 of these reports at 400 pages each in the biggest suitcase I can find. I can't bring any clothes with me, so I'm wearing one suit that my mom bought me, my suitcase full of reports, and I'm off to Ottawa. And I'm a law student, and this is just like the most extraordinary thing. And I arrive in Ottawa, and Libby's coached me and told me what's you know, about to happen and what I should do and what do I do when I get to security on Parliament Hill. And I get to Parliament Hill, and I'm lugging this giant suitcase, and I'm wearing my only suit, and I'm walking up the steps. And all of a sudden, I realize what's about to happen, and I start to feel quite unwell. I get extremely nervous and then start to feel like super unwell and then I throw up all over myself uh, as I'm making my way to Parliament Hill. So now I've got like vomit on the legs of my pants and I've got like this briefcase or the suitcase of reports and I'm just like things are not feeling good right now. So what do I do? I make it, I beeline straight to Libby's office and I collapse on her couch and I'm just like don't know what to do. I'm just a mess. So Libby and her staff like splash some water on my face and like I put some like chat stick on. <laughs> they convinced me that the vomit on my pants looked like salt off the road. They were like, you're good. They'll never know. And Libby said, off you go. You can do this. And she led me down the hall to where my next, or my first meeting was going to be. And of course, there I go. And so it was in that moment when she told me that I could do this and walked me down the hall and showed me that she believed in me that kind of everything changed for me. And I took your words, Libby, you can do this. And I filed them in that part of your brain where you save important moments. And then you go back to those moments when you need a dose of courage. It was in that moment, Libby, that you changed everything for me. And it was in that moment that I realized this was my life's work. And even in those moments of fear and unbelievable anxiety, and even when I don't know if I can do it, I just have to tell myself that I can and give it my best shot. So I really tell you this story as an example of who Libby is and that she's just a truly different politician. Politicians are supposed to help their constituents be heard, but how many can say they will do everything in their power to ensure that the most marginalized voices are heard by government? It shows her commitment to Canada being a true democracy, where all voices are reaching government, where they're truly heard and where they're treated equally. And so I want to tell you what some sex workers are saying about you, Libby, on this important day. Amy Leibovich, who was one of the plaintiffs in the Bedford case, and Sherry Kisselbach, who was one of the plaintiffs in the BC case challenging Canada's laws, uh, both sent me some statements to read to you tonight. So Amy, an amazing leader in the movement, says, 
Libby's strong, unwavering support for me and my sex working colleagues is ever present in my life. In this world, which often views us as disposable, Libby does not see us that way. Libby sees us as human beings, people deserving of human rights. While others in her position have stayed silent, Libby has used her public platform to further what we as sex workers have been calling for, for decades decriminalization. Her words and actions for my community will not be forgotten. As a sex worker, I want to thank Libby for her love and support and for listening, listening to sex workers and believing in us. And Sherry says that Libby was a hard-working and honest politician who maintained a strong grassroots approach when working with people and diverse communities. She cared about others and really listened. She has consistently raised issues of concern to her constituents for immediate action to protect the safety and rights of sex workers. I applaud her groundbreaking work. Thank you for your hard work, service, dedication, and for your love of the community. And so you can see from these quotes that, I mean, Libby has just uh, shown extraordinary commitment to her community and the social justice vision that lives here. And I've mentioned a few issues, and I could list so many, Libby, that you have been an important leader on. Um, I could talk about the national housing strategy and the investment that you forced the federal government to make. I could talk about marijuana law reform. I could talk about parliamentary support uh, to address prescription drug shortages, government support for survivors of thalidomide, physician-assisted death. I could talk about marriage equality, and it is so worth noting that you were the first openly lesbian MP in the House. And before that, as a city councillor, I could go on and on about Libby, like swimming around tankers in English Bay when she wanted Vancouver to be deemed a nuclear-free zone, and taking a delegation to Washington State, believing that U.S. was actually the bearer of weapons of mass destruction. And the list goes on. And after 40 years of public service, after being in Parliament for 18 years and six consecutive election victories, on her final day in the House of Commons, she read a poem written by Sandy Cameron, an activist from the downtown east side. And the following is an excerpt of what Libby said to the House on that day. The map we inherited isn't any good. The old roads mislead, and the landscape keeps changing. People are confused and drift from place to place, clothes scorched by fire, eyes red with smoke. And I thought about who you were in the house and the role you played there, and I asked Stephen Lewis for a quote about you. You may know that Stephen Lewis is an incredible Canadian human rights hero who has fought uh, for uh, HIV prevention and treatment and uh, you know, the elimination of HIV around the world. And this is what Stephen said about you, Libby. There were two astonishing facets to Libby's role as a parliamentarian. First, she had a grasp of every conceivable subject and spoke effortlessly on every issue. It was mind-boggling. There was no other member of our party, or indeed of any party, who so authoritatively carried debate. Second, Libby never made a single speech where she didn't compliment the MP who had introduced the motion, or someone who had spoken before her. It was an unprecedented show of political generosity. In a mean-spirited House of Commons, she was a beacon of civility who made us proud. Libby, what an emotional time for you, what an exciting time for you, and what a beautiful time for all of us to fill you with love as you enter the next stage of your life and your career. You are a person of incredible integrity, you're a bold and courageous leader, and you show endless compassion and selflessness. Know that you have changed our country, you have changed our city, and you have impacted each and every one of us just by being you by being so true to who you are and to the community that you've represented. We love you. Yeah.